Okay, watch this. There we go. Activity 2.4, inverse by composition. You know that when the domain is restricted to x greater than or equal to 0, the function f of x equals the square root of x is the inverse of the power function g of x equals x squared. You also know that the function h of x equals the cube root of x is the inverse of the power function q of x equals x cubed. The process of evaluating one function inside of another function is called the composition of functions. For two functions, f and g, the composition of functions uses the output of one function as the input of the other is expressed as f of x equals or g of f of x. All right, go ahead and look over the worked example. Let's take a look at number one. Determine g of f of x for the function g of x equals x squared and f of x equals the square root of x for x squared and equal to zero. So we have g of f of x is g of the square root of x, which equals square root of x squared. Well, the squared cancels the square root, so you're left with x. All right, let's take a look at 2. If f of g of x equals g of f of x equals x, then f of x and g of x are inverse functions. 2. Are f of x and g of x inverse functions? Explain your reasoning. So f of g of x is f of x squared equals the square root of x squared. Well, the square root cancels the squared, so you're left with x. So then g of f of x is g of the square root of x equals the square root of x squared. Well, the squared cancels the square root, and you're left with x. When the domain is restricted to x greater than equal to 0, the functions f of x and g of x are inverses because f of g of x equals x and g of f of x equals x. All right, let's take a look at next page. 3. Algebraic determine whether the functions in each pair are inverses. Show your work. So a, h of x equals the cube root of x and q of x equals x cubed. So h of q of x is h of x cubed equals the cube root of x cubed. Well, the cube root cancels the cube, which equals x. So q of h of x, is the cube root of x, equals the cube root of x cubed. Well, the cube cancels the cube root, and you're left with x. So the functions h of x and q of x are inverses. All right, let's take a look at b. k of x equals 2x squared plus 5, and j of x equals negative 2x squared minus 5. So k of j of x is negative 2x squared minus 5, which equals 2 times negative 2x squared minus 5 plus 5, which equals negative 4x squared minus 10 plus 5, which equals negative 4x squared minus 5, which is not x. So then you have j of k of x, which is which equals negative 4x squared minus 10 minus 5 equals negative 4x squared minus 15. Since neither of them equals x, the functions k of x and j of x are not inverses. All right, go ahead and finish it up. All right, go ahead and mark out four. Let's take a look at the next page. Activity 2.5, pendulums. The time it takes for one complete swing of a pendulum depends on the length of the pendulum and the acceleration due to gravity. 
The formula for the time it takes a pendulum to complete one swing is t equals 2 pi times the square root of l divided by g, where t is the time in seconds, l is the length of the pendulum, using g as the acceleration due to gravity in meters per second squared. 1. Write a function t of l that represents the time of one pendulum swing. That is t of l equals 2 pi times the square root of l divided by 9.8. 2. Use technology to sketch the graph of the function t of l. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's use Desmos. So we have 2. Here. We need pi, which is right here, times the square root of... We have to use x instead of l, x divided by 9.8. So we have 0, 0. One, two point zero zero seven. Let's round that to one decimal place. So two point zero. Let's go to two. It is two point eight three. Let's round that to one decimal place. So two point eight. Let's go to three. So that would be three point five. a little bit and then let's go to four so that would be four point zero and let's go to five that's ten pi divided by six so it's kind of a weird number so another way to do this is we can actually plug five into the equation so two pi square root of 5 divided by 9.8 and we get 4.5 okay so there's our values let's go ahead and graph so 0 0 1 2 3 3.5 which is the approximate there, four, four, five, four point five, which is enough points to draw our curve. All right, go ahead and finish up the graphing table. All right, let's take a look at the next page. Three, describe the characteristics of the function, such as its domain, range, and intercept. Explain your reasoning. The function has a point at 0, 0, and it's increasing for all values of L greater than equal to 0. The domain is L greater than equal to 0. The range is T greater than equal to 0. There are no values of L or T less than 0 because negative length and negative time do not make sense in this problem. Four, how long does it take for one complete swing when the length of the pendulum is 0 0.5 meters? So we need to plug in 0 0.5 into the equation. Okay, let's come back over here. And so that's 2 pi square root of 0 0.5 divided by 9.8. So that's 1.4. So when the length of the pendulum is 0 0.5 meters, the time it takes a pendulum to complete one full swing is 1.4 seconds. All right, go ahead and mark out five. All right, let's take a look at the next page. Six. Many museums display what is known as a Foucault pendulum. As a Foucault pendulum, 
swings back and forth throughout the day. The Earth rotation causes it to appear to move in a circular direction. If the pendulum takes one day to complete, come back to its initial position on the circle, approximately how many full pendulum swings occur each day? Okay, so there's your pendulum. All right, so to answer this question, step one, calculate how long one swing of the pendulum takes. So T of 200, so we're going to plug 200 into the equation. So that's 2 pi square root of 200 divided by 9.8, which is 28.4. Okay, so one swing of the pendulum takes 28.4 seconds. Okay, step two. Calculate how many seconds are in one day. There are 24 times 60 times 60 seconds in a day. So let's go ahead and calculate that. Which is 86,400. So there are 86,400 seconds in one day. Step three, divide the number of seconds in one day by the number of seconds one swing of the pendulum takes. So 86,400 divided by 28.4. Now let's, let's round that to a whole number so we have a whole number of swings. So, there are 3,042 pendulum swings will occur in one day. All right, go ahead and finish it up. Let's take a look at the next page. Activity 2.6, centrifugal force. The rotor is a popular amusement park ride shaped like a cylindrical room. Riders can stand against the circular wall of the room while the room spins. When the rotor reaches the necessary speed, the floor drops out of the centrifugal force, leaves the riders pinned up against the wall. Minimum speed measured in meters per second requires to keep a person pinned against the wall during the ride can be determined with the function S of R equals 4.95 times the square root of R, where R is the radius of the rotor measured in meters. Number one, an amusement park designed a rotor ride with a radius of two meters. At what speed does it need to spin? So we're gonna plug two into the equation. So let's go ahead and do that. So 4.95 times the square root of 2, which is 7. So the ride would need to spin at least 7 meters per second. Number 2. The same park decided to build a larger rotor ride with a radius of 4 meters. At what speed does it need to spin? So go back here. And we're going to change 2 to 4. 9.9, .9, which let's go ahead and round that to 10. The ride would need to spin at least 10 meters per second. Right, number three. Designers at another park have a motor that could spin a, a rotor ride at six meters per second. What is the length of the radius of the ride? So we're going to solve the equation for R when S of R is six. So let's go ahead and do that. So to do that, we're going to divide 4.95 by both sides. Anything divided by itself is 1. So we need to do 6 divided by 4.95, which is, let's round to one decimal place, 1 1.2 equals the square root of r. And then we need to square both sides. Well, the square cancels the square root, so you get r equals 1.2 squared. Is 1.4. So designers could make a rotor ride with a radius of 
meters. All right, go ahead and finish it up. Let's take a look at the next page. All right, go ahead and mark this page out. Right. Talk to talk. Masters of the inverse. You know that the inverse of an invertible function, f of x, can be represented using the notation f inverse of x. Go ahead and mark that out. Two. How does knowing the domain range and intercepts of other key characteristics of a power function help you determine those characteristics for the function's inverse? Explain your reason. The domain of a function is the range of its inverse, and the range of a function is the domain of the inverse. The x-intercepts of functions are the y-intercepts of the inverse, and the y-intercepts of a function are the x-intercepts of the inverse. 3. When a function has an asymptote, does its inverse have an asymptote? If so, describe the location of the asymptote for the function's inverse. If a function has an asymptote, its inverse most have an asymptote as well, because the inverse is a transformation of the original function. If a function asymptote is at x equals 0, then the asymptote for its inverse will be at y equals 0. I'll go ahead and finish that up. Let's take a look at the next page. Four, complete the table. All right, go ahead and read over that and complete the table. Five, determine whether each statement is true or false. If false, explain the, the error in the statement. Inverses of all radical functions are functions. True. The inverses of an even degree power functions are always inverse. That's false. The inverse of an even degree power function are only functions if the domain of the power function is restricted to x greater than or equal to zero. C. The inverses of odd degree power functions are always functions. That is true. Let's take a look at the next page. Go ahead and mark this off. The student works 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. Let's take a look at the next page. The student works 2A, 2C, 1, 2A, and 2B. Mark that out. All right, go ahead and start working on your assignment and have a wonderful Wildcat day.